So tonight we're actually going to be looking at uh, an interesting subject. Uh, we're going to be diving into church discipline, which is something that really is often not practiced um, and very few places you'll see on the planet where this is done. And for some of us, it's quite hard to process because, you know, we come from a lot of different places theologically and God is a God of love. And so how does this fit in with that? But I think we fail to understand what God's love is like. And so we end up actually misunderstanding the ways of the king. And so uh, really the heart of discipline, which is uh, it's one of the tools that God gives a parent, but also elders within the life of a church to actually grow people up into a healthy whole scenario. And, and again, discipline is something that uh, the Bible says God uses. In, in Hebrews, it actually says that God chastises those that he loves as sons. And if you're not being chastised, you're not a true son. And church discipline is really about uh, caring and loving people through into um, that they're about in Jesus. I want to dig into this with you. We want to dig into this into the Bible because, again, the Bible is the manual. It's how God tells us the church must be built. And so even if we're uncomfortable with this, we have to kind of grapple with this and learn God's way so that we actually build the church the way he wants it to be built. And maybe to begin, before I dig into discipline itself, we've seen in some of the other sessions how Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2 that he longs to present the church a pure spotless bride to Christ, but that he's worried that somehow they might be led astray from their sincere and pure devotion to Jesus. And so there's this longing in the heart of leaders and the heart of leadership is to present individuals before God on that last day. Uh, but in the forming and shaping of lives, uh, it's, it's a lot of work. And a lot of people think church is just a place you go to to listen to teaching. But teaching is, is only one very minor tool that leaders are supposed to use to actually develop and shape us in our faith. And so in 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, we see um, Paul writing it to Timothy. And he says, preach the word. So there is preaching. Be prepared in season and out of season. And then he says, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. And so, yeah, you've got this concept of you've got teaching, but you've also got correction, rebuke, and encouragement. And so you start to realize that actually our job as leaders is not just to you should come up on a Sunday and we expound on some theology, but it's actually to help apply the Bible and God's ways into the individual's life. And we really do see this in Matthew 28, the Great Commission. In verse 20, Jesus says this. He doesn't say this. Go and teach everyone everything that I taught you. He says this in Matthew 28, 20, 20 and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. In other words, we don't just teach. We teach to obey. And so our role as shepherds isn't just to educate your mind. It's to form your lives, to, to help you grow and develop in Christ-likeness, in maturity, so that you actually are taught to obey the Lord. Um, and that's a really, it's a very different thing from just teaching you. And I hope you enjoyed that teaching. I'll see you next week. Uh, it's teaching to obey. And one of the key things, obviously, to teach to obey is teaching, as we've seen. They're, they're setting an example. Paul would often write about setting an example for the believers in speech and life and love and in doctrine. But then at the same time, there is correcting and disciplining, which is really much like a parent would model, teach, but also shape and mold and at times bring out uh, the rod or discipline. So, so, and the reason for that is because we're not yet perfect. We're not actually fully saved yet. We, we've been saved, the Bible uses kind of in three ways. We've been saved, we are being saved, we will be saved. And so we're on this journey between what Jesus has done on the cross and what, what has happened through faith, that we've been made right with God through faith and he's forgiven us of our sin. But now God is forming his image into us and we are to grow up to be like him and there's this process that happens of us growing up to really uh, become what he's made us on the cross we're supposed to become holy as he is holy and that is what the christian life is about it's growing in holiness until we finally die and then we finally graduate into glory we're all like him now the challenge with us is we're still on the earth and we're not yet fully redeemed so all of us have kind of got this tension between us, between the part that God has come and written his law into our heart in the new covenant and we want to obey him and we want to love him. But there's another part of us, our old self, the flesh. And that part still fights against the spirit in us. And so every one of us have got this tussle that we've got to put to death our old man and allow Jesus to come out and be formed in us. And obviously situations can provoke the, the flesh, that, that part of you that's not yet surrendered and yielded. 
Um, and then that's something that God would use to try and teach us to become like him. So James says it like this in James 1 verse 14 to 15. It says, and it's talking to Christians, it says, but each one is tempted when by his own evil desire. Do you know that you've still got an, you're, you've still got an evil desire? Sin is still sort of attractive. There is a part of you that will be drawn by sin's power. And so you get tempted when your own evil desires draw you to do something that you shouldn't. And then those desires drag you away and, they enti and, is it, and entice you to do what you shouldn't do. And the problem is then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So you get drawn to do something. Something happens, you're reacting, you can feel anger or something rising up. And it's, dr it's like dragging you into doing something you shouldn't do. And once that happens, once it's conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So we still have this fight on in us between what Jesus has done for us to save us from death, but there is still sin trying to pull us to ultimately draw us back to sin and even maybe to eventually we'll look at to possibly even turn away from Christ because of sin. And this is where we dive into church to spin a, a, a little bit deeper. And so we have to teach people how to obey and how to turn away from sin. And obviously the Bible says, if anyone says he's without sin, he's a liar and the truth is not within him. But because of the new covenant, because of what Jesus has done in our hearts, we, don't, we shouldn't like sin. We, we should want to turn away from it. And so you'll find you're, you're, you're continually wanting to not sin. That's a sign that you are actually saved. So, um, and the Bible says if we do sin, we can, in Hebrews 4, 16, uh, let us then approach the throne of grace. This is if you find yourself sin, you've fallen, you've kind of fallen down in that little trap and sin has now got you. And, it, and, and it, if you don't deal with the sin, it's going to eventually kill you. So you bring your sin and you come before God, even though you fail, but you can come and approach the throne of grace with confidence. In other words, God has paid for that sin on the cross. And so you can approach the throne of grace with confidence, knowing that you will receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. In other words, God doesn't punish us when he sins because Jesus was punished, but we can come boldly into his presence and say, Father, I've messed up. Please forgive me. And God will give us mercy because of Jesus and grace to help us. In other words, power now. God's, God literally reaching out into our lives to give us his strength, his power to help us in our weakness, in our time of need. And so that's normally the Christian life. We, we're struggling with sin and you'll find as you're walking this thing out, you fall, you come to the Lord, Lord, I'm so sorry, forgive me. He washes, he cleanses, he forgives. But sometimes... If we don't deal with sin, the, the, there is an end result. If it stays there too long, if you don't deal with it, it will eventually produce death is what James tells us. And so what happens then is sometimes sin is so attractive, so nice, that we don't want to stop doing it. And that could be a number of different things, but sin has a, an allure, draw all, all of its own. And so what happens if someone carries on sinning? They, they just keep on keeping on and... Uh, uh, there's a whole thing that starts to happen if we look at our Bibles and we need to understand that to understand why discipline comes in. So the Bible says in Hebrews 3 verse 12 to, to 15, and this is just a chapter before the verse we just read, it's talking about um, what sin does. And it says, see to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. So if your heart starts to get given over to sinfulness, eventually something happens to your faith. You get an unbelieving heart. And that will eventually maybe cause you, it's possible that you might turn away from the living God. But the writer says, encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So now we realize that sin gives death because it's got this thing in it. It's got this way, ability to harden our hearts and to cause deception to come to our lives. We'll dig into that just now. And so we have come to share, the writer says, in Christ, if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. In other words, you got saved by grace. You got to keep coming back to the grace of God. You got to find that confidence in him. And then if you hold firmly to Jesus till the end, you're going to be saved. But if you don't deal with sin properly, it comes in, it hardens your heart, it's deceitful, we'll dig into that, and it can actually do damage to you. And so as it has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, if he speaks to you, if God is convicting you of something, do not harden your hearts 
as they, Israel, did in the rebellion. And so there's this warning now that we've got to take sin quite seriously. It might not instantly cause us to lose our salvation because we've been covered by the blood of Jesus, but it has got this way of doing something that can eventually kill us. And so to dig into what is what does the writer tell us sin does, it tells us that it's deceptive. It's got this ability to deceive us. It hides the truth from us. So if you start to allow sin in your life, you know, deal with it, eventually you'll find it that it's like a deception will come over your understanding and you'll start justifying yourself or you'll start finding ways around it. And so sin is deceptive. That's why we don't want to go near it. Deception means you don't realize that you're starting to get messed up. You don't see the danger that's coming. You just start to believe that everything's all right. And then it says that this will harden your heart. And that's a terrible thing. Uh, the heart and heart is, is a place where sin becomes so common in your life that you're not dealing with it. You're not coming to the throne of grace and finding grace in your time of need. And as long as you carry on in that sin, it starts to rub you. And I often think years ago, I used to be a whitewater kayaker. I used to, uh, I love kayaking rivers and going over waterfalls and things like that. And um, when you're paddling on a river, it's a lot of fun. The problem is if you haven't paddled in a while, your hands are quite sensitive. They're not, they don't have calluses or anything hard. So as you're paddling, the paddle's just slipping a little bit every time and eventually it starts to get a bit uncomfortable. And as you keep paddling and paddling, you're enjoying it so much, eventually you start to find it gets really uncomfortable. You've had a blister form because of something that you're doing. And at that point, you almost want to get off the river because your hand's getting quite sore. Then the blister pops and then it's really sore. But if you carry on pushing through that, because sometimes the rivers are that much fun, you just ignore it. What eventually you find is you develop calluses. And a callus is hardened skin. Your skin has gone past the sensitive stage. And now the, the result of that continual rubbing is actually it becomes callous, it becomes hardened. And I remember my hands at that time got so hardened by calluses that I could stick a needle right through those callus. And I could, I could, I mean, my, my hands were hard as, as they were like tires, you know, and, and my hands had grown hardened by paddling. Now the Bible says, this is what sin does to your heart. It comes and it rubs you and the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says, hey, come back to God, come repent of your sin. And if you don't listen to God and you keep carrying on because it's so much fun, that thing starts to eventually become more and more painful. And eventually there's a bursting and eventually a callus starts to form. And eventually you can't feel anymore. And eventually God's speaking and you can't hear him. You've actually become calloused. And so the Bible says these people's hearts have become calloused. And that's what he said to the Jews. You're not even seeing me. I'm right in front of you. And you can't see that I'm your Messiah because your hearts have become calloused because of sin. And that's obviously Matthew 13, 15. This people's heart has become calloused. And remember this. The Bible says, where, where does faith come? Well, the Bible says in Romans 10, 10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. So he's just warned us about a calloused heart. So when faith comes, God works in your heart, doesn't he? He comes and lives in your heart and he, he, he writes his law into your heart he, that you want to obey. Him. But now sin comes and it starts to do something else to your heart. Where God has made your heart alive, sin starts to form a hard and deceptive callousness. And so when you're, if you believe in your heart, and you've got to guard your heart. And that's exactly what the Bible says in Proverbs 4, verse 23. Above all else, most important thing you're going to get out of this, guard your heart. For it is the wellspring of life. In other words, that's where life springs from. If you don't guard your heart and sin has its way, the callousness comes. Eventually, your heart grows hardened, which means your faith starts to die. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If, if you've got a callous, you're no longer hearing, so your faith starts to shrivel up and die. And so sin doesn't directly kill you, but sin kills your faith slowly if you don't deal with it. And as your faith starts to die, you actually get into a point where you can have a heart uh, that actually falls into unbelief and the warning in Hebrews can actually turn away from the living God. And if you've been in the church longer than five years, you will have seen people who have turned away from the living God. They once were in him, they re rejoiced, they spoke in tongues, they prophesied, they led people to Jesus, but they didn't deal with sin properly. And so sin began to damage their heart until the point that they eventually got deceptive. And you'll start to find they'll believe false doctrines and actually I'm secure and God loves me no matter what I do. And, and before long, 
you see them out of the church and you see them just not doing anything for the king anymore. They've now turned away from the living God. And so we have come to share in Christ, the writer says, if we hold firmly till the end the confidence that we had at first. Do you see that? So there was a solid little exposition on what sin does in us. So now we bring this to the church. What happens if you see your brother doing that? You see someone starting to give themselves over to sin. And um, because sin can cause you eventually to turn away from God, but it also causes you to turn away from your brothers. Because in 1 John 1, 7, we read, if we live in the light as he is in the light, we have true fellowship. And the blood of Jesus covers a multitude of sins. So you'll find as I'm dealing with my sin before the Lord and I can find grace for what I'm doing wrong, uh, he'll wash me and he'll cleanse me and I, my heart is still fine. And I'll find with my brothers, I can share with you because we're all struggling with sin. But as I lose this relationship, this one follows very soon. And suddenly I don't want to live in the light because I'm feeling you might judge me. I'm feeling, and so you start to hide. And as soon as you hide, you're no longer living in the light and fellowship starts. So you'll, you'll know your brother and sister is starting to fall into sin when you see them drawing back from fellowship. It's one of the great indicators that sin has taken a hold. And you can't see this relationship, but you can see this relationship. And so when you see someone pulling back, you start to realize there's probably a sin. Something has crept in and caused them to lose the love that they had at first. Does that make sense? And so the danger is this. Sin, if it's not dealt with, if that person stays in the church, remember the Bible says that we are members of, of Christ's body. We are joined together. We are one new man. So that means, and the Bible says, if one part suffers, all parts suffer because we're connected somehow spiritually. Uh, and so <laughs> what that means is if a person is walking in unrepentant sin, they potentially break something open over the entire church. In the Old Testament, there was a man called Achan. Who, and God clearly said to Israel as they went into the promised land, they, they fought this one battle. God said, don't take anything from that city. But this guy saw something he wanted and hid it in his tent. And Israel went to battle. And you would think one man in the nation sinned. One man. And when the nation went to their battle, they lost that battle. And they, they, got, they got the snot beaten out of them. And they came back to God, kind of, what is going on? You're supposed to give us victory. Why are we losing the battles now? And they eventually got before God and began to seek him. And God said, well, there's sin. There's sin in one of the people in the camp. And so they eventually draw lots and it works out. It ends up, with, they find out it's a guy called Achan. One man sinned, caused the whole nation to lose battles. People died and actually the blessing of God lifted from that. And so you start to realize being a part of a church is actually quite a big deal because what you do affects me, what I do affects you. So deal with sin quickly. And I remember just an illustration of this. Years ago, I was asked as a young man to... Um, a man I greatly admired. He was a, an apostle, Dudley Daniels. And man, for me, he was like the apostle Paul. He led a group called New Covenant and I was one of the young leaders in his movement. And he saw something in my life and asked me and about 20 other guys to come over to, I think it was to America um, and to spend, I think it was a month with him. And he was going to do training on serving the churches in an apostolic role. And I have to confess, I was so excited about that. It just it was, like, it was like Paul the Apostle had asked me if I wanted to do that. I was, so I was super excited. But uh, a few days before we went over to America, uh, we had a, 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 an event in Hart Bay, which is the other side of Cape Town, stayed at a friend's house. And I woke up that morning with a little bump on my leg. And I first thought, oh, it's like a mosquito must have bit me last night. Second day, the bump was a little bit bigger. And I thought it was a bit of a weird mosquito bite, a little bit sore, but it wasn't too bad. Third day, and I think it was the day before I was supposed to fly to America. I woke up in the middle of the night sweating and I'd woken up because the blanket, my sheet had actually touched my leg and my leg somewhere had gone from, this is uncomfortable to, it felt like my leg was on fire. And a blanket, just a sheet touching the leg felt literally like it was agonizing pain. And so I woke up and my leg was, it was burning. It was red. I remember this bright red on my leg and it was so sore. And I was like, oh my goodness, something's seriously wrong. So I phoned a doctor in the church, um, actually first phoned a chemist in the church, Mornay, and I said to Mornay, Mornay, I'm going to America tomorrow, come and look at my leg. And he came in and he said this to me, he said, okay, you've been bitten by a spider, it's probably the kind of spider that's got a, a poison that actually rots your flesh. So you've got septicemia. Basically what's happened is the poison that is injected in you has caused your cells to begin to rot. And that rot is now starting to spread 
you're in danger of losing your leg. You could actually die. This is quite serious. You need to go to hospital. And I was like, nah, I'm going to America tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not going to hospital because I knew that was going to be. So I phoned a doctor in the church and said, please help. I've got to go to America tomorrow. I'm not missing it for anything. Uh, come and check my leg. And he came to my house, saw my leg and said, no, you need to go to hospital. You could lose your leg. Good chance you're going to lose your leg already. It's, it's, it's quite far advanced. Your leg is bad. It's rotting basically. And if we don't get it, if we don't stop this rot, it will spread and you'll die from this. So I said, I'm not going to hospital. Do it here. He said, no, you don't understand. I need to put you out. And I said, no, nah, I'm not getting put out. I'm going to America tomorrow. <laughs> so, so just inject me, yeah, in my home. Surely you can do that because I know you can't knock me out in my home. And he said, no, your leg is so rotten right now that the, 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 the injection that will numb the pain is not going to work. It's useless. I can't inject you. The only thing I can do is operate without any painkillers. And I remember thinking, I'm going to America tomorrow, so how bad can it be? <laughs> so uh, he said, I remember him looking at me and saying, are you sure about this? And I was like, yeah. And, and then I, the, I started getting a bit weird when he pulled out a, a towel <laughs> and wet it and put it in my, <laughs> in my mouth. And then I started thinking, okay, this is starting to feel. And then my leg is so sore, I, honestly, I couldn't touch it. I could not touch it. And he pulled out a scalpel and, and, and I realized, okay, he's going to cut my leg now. I was sitting on this chair, I got to feel my mouth, and I got two guys holding me. And, uh, and I thought he was going to cut me like, and he literally did this, okay, ready? He's got it like in a stab position. He goes, ready? <laughs> One, two, three. And he just went into my leg with a scalpel. And I remember this thing just disappearing into my leg and pus and blood just pouring out. And I, I cannot tell you, I couldn't touch my leg. I, I didn't, I mean, I was like, I started, I wanted to vomit from the pain. I remember this ice cold feeling of like, I was going to faint. Mm. And anyway, so he's popped it now and I'm like, okay, is it over? He says, no, 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 no. I've got to get everything out there because all the junk inside of your leg is, 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 is potentially going to kill everything else. I have to clean it out. So the next thing he says, okay, I've got to squeeze it. And I'm thinking, okay, bro, just <laughs> squeeze it like this, you know? And he goes, one, two, three. Three and he just starts squeezing like he is not being gentle. He is he wants everything out. And I am at that point, like you guys are holding, I'm actually starting to pass out from the pain. And I'm, I remember wanting to vomit. There was a bucket there, and I'm literally like, uh, because I mean, I've never felt pregnancy. I'm sorry, ladies, you have no idea what I went through. <laughs> and then finally, I, he finishes that, and he's like, "Is it over?" And I'm I'm on honestly on the edge of consciousness. I'm not exaggerating. I'm on the edge of consciousness. And I think, okay, it's done. And he says, yeah, I've just got one more thing to do. And he pulls out this monster syringe, you know, the kind that you inject horses with, like it's, it's this monster thing. And he boils the kettle and he puts boiling water into the syringe because he says, I have to cauterize the wound inside. And then he, he injects it in and he goes, ready? One, two, three. And he injected what was more than a cup of boiling water inside my leg. And I did pass out. Actually, I actually passed out totally out. Lost, out. And I remember sort of waking up as they dragged me downstairs too. And, and I, I woke up the next morning and I flew to America. <laughs> My leg had actually, he'd managed to clean it up. But the thing that got me was this. Man, I didn't think that thing was serious. But I nearly lost my leg and I could have died. And that was, I would say that if you did it again, I, I, I wouldn't go through that again. It was torture. And you realize what a little bit of sin can do if we don't do with it. The Bible actually says that a little bit of yeast in 1 Corinthians 11.30 works through the whole, sorry, in, in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 6, a little bit of yeast works through the whole batch of dough. And it's talking specifically about the church. One person's sin is like yeast in bread. It works its way through and it begins to infect everyone. And so if one person walks in sin, it's as though that starts to happen. And rot starts to set into the body. And if that rot is not dealt with, eventually it will kill the whole church. In 1 Corinthians 11 verse 30, Paul actually says about people that are sinning and they're not dealing with it. He says, that is why many among you are weak and ill and some of you have died. They're not dealing with sin. That's why some of you are getting sick and some of you are dying. In other words, what happened to my leg starts to happen to the church. Sin is deadly. We don't mess around with it. We need to fix it. And so what do we do if you see your brother sinning? How do we begin to walk through this 
helping a brother out because the Bible says that we are actually responsible partly for our brothers. And so in James 5, 19, we read, My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth, in other words, you're turning away from the Lord, why? Because of sin. And someone should bring him back. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. So we have this responsibility to care for one another. And if we see a brother going into sin and turning away from the truth, we must go after them and try and draw them back. And if we bring them back, we save them from death and cover, and, and the blood of Jesus then can cover their sins and they can come back into the redeemed. But if they carry on down that road, they might, by hardened by sins of the turn from Christ and maybe not even be found in Him because they didn't persevere to the end. You with me? So we need to find them. And I, and I, I don't think we realize how important it is that we do this. And I remember I, most, from when I got saved, I was pretty much flat out for Jesus. But there was one time that I came very close to slipping away. And it was actually orientated around, you're going to laugh now, but man, I, I, MC, my wife, got this ridiculous job opportunity. And uh, suddenly she was able to earn like seriously a lot of money. And I remember getting really excited about that. But the Bible says that money is a dangerous thing if we don't guard it. And it was the first time we had potentially money. And I started falling in love with stuff. I wanted things. And I remember driving down the road and I'd be noticing motorbikes. And I was just like, oh. And this thing got too important for me. And I started finding that uh, over a period of time, uh, my heart started going cold for church and cold for the kingdom. I still went to church. But I, like, that, that fire was gone and I was just starting to slip away. And I'll never forget, um, I was going less and less for church. My commitment to church looked like it was more of a commitment now. It wasn't as nice as it was. And I, I, visit, I was in church one Sunday and a guest preacher was there. A young man still in the Lord. And uh, he was talking about King David. And he's talking about how King David, you know, goes up onto the roof and he looks down one day and he's this king that God loves. And he looks down and he sees a beautiful woman, Bathsheba, bathing. And he wants her. And so he ends up explaining how David gives into sin and falls in sin with this woman and murders her husband and kind of everything's going wrong until eventually he repents. And then he stops in the middle of his preach and points at me. Yep. Says you. And I was like, no one does that in the middle of a preach. So I was like, he said, don't look behind me. You, I had long hair. You with the long hair and the blue shirt. I said, you, God's showing me that you are like a David. And God says, I've called you, put my spirit upon you. I've called you to be one who will build my house. But like David, you've been tempted by the world. And I promise you in that moment, I remember it was like God put his finger on my forehead. And, I, and, and he said this, as Bathsheba came to sift David, so the world has come to sift you. And God says, have I not called you? Have I not put my spirit upon you? Turn your heart back to me. And the fear of God came over me when I realized in that moment, it was like I was deceived by sins of deceitfulness. But in that moment, I knew like I knew like I knew that God had my number and I needed to turn back. And that man's preach turned my life around. I don't know what would have happened if he had not confronted me in my sin. I don't know what David would have done if the prophet Nathan didn't come to him and confront him in his sin. And so we have this duty to come when we see a brother in sin, to come and try and restore them and bring them back to God. And this is what we see in Matthew 18, verse 15 to 17. It says this, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Uh, and so, and then it says, if he refuses to listen to them, so now it's, it's, this is escalating. It starts, go, go on your own. If you won't listen, you bring some others. If you won't listen to them, then you tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So now we start to see Jesus teaching about how discipline will start to happen in his house. And the first thing is this, if you see someone sinning, go to them. Just don't tell others about it, just go to the person. Say, hey man, I'm worried about you. Are you all right? I'm noticing this. And if he listens to you, like James says, you won him over. He repents and he's covered. It's sorted, it's done and dusted. Blood of Jesus covers a multitude of sins. But if he doesn't listen to you and says, well, I like this. I don't feel like it is sin or you know, who are you to judge whatever he's going to throw at you. Then you need to bring another brother with you because every matter in the church must be established by my two or more witnesses. 
If you won't listen to those, and I would suggest in that scenario, we'd normally bring an elder with you. In other words, you need to say, hey guys, are you aware that you know, Joe is doing this? And I just, you need to be aware of it. And then go together because we need to make sure that we're doing this as best as we can because we're trying to save a man's soul here uh, or a woman's soul. And if you won't listen then, then you, it goes from a private thing to a public thing. It moves to a public, bring it to the whole church. And we'll look at that just now in a bit of detail. And then if you won't listen to the whole church, and I'll run through that through in a bit of detail how it works, treat him as you would a Gentile and a tax collector. Okay, so let's, let's dig into this. Start off, go to your brother privately. If you see someone and say, don't talk about it to others, go to him and say, hey man, I'm worried about you. What are you doing? Uh, Galatians 6, 1, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempt tempted. Carry each other's burdens. Realize this, sin is a dangerous thing. If his sin has already taken hold in him, he's going to start justifying why he's in this position and blaming others. See, he might say, well, I'm here because no one in the church loves. And I'd, what's happened now is sin is actually starting to deceive him. And so now he's starting to vomit. He's starting to infect the body. So you're trying to restore him and suddenly you're going, actually, oh, maybe, maybe there's a problem in the church. Now, now, this, now the infection's jumped to you. So be careful because you yourself might get caught in what he's falling into. You're getting that. Be very careful. One sin's there, you've got to be very, very careful. It's dangerous. In fact, the Bible says we should even hate clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Sin is so powerful that even if a sinner has, you, you, even I don't want to touch his clothes, but I want to restore my brother. So I do it gently. So we do it privately, unless, unless I need to say this. So if someone sins in the church and they repent, it's not the rest of the church's knowledge because it's covered, it's dealt with. Unless... It needs to be said, if let's say a young girl falls sexually and she falls pregnant, she can find forgiveness. But now the challenge is she's pregnant. It's going to be a little bit weird if every Sunday she comes and she's a little bit bigger and no one's talking about what's going on. So in scenarios like that, while her sin should be kept private because it's between her and God, now the body needs to know because we need to help her take care of that child because she's a single mom. And it's mean that even though she's messed up, we're going to love her as a family and we're going to treat that child like it's perfect. It's going to grow up in a family with us. So we need to know that. And so there are times that a pro private sin might become a public thing. And it's not here to discipline or punish. It's just so that we can care properly. Another scenario would be, I remember I've been in more than one occasion where uh, people have come forward and confessed they're pedophiles. They struggle with children. But now they're saved and they're in the church. But they've got this weak error in their lives. I think the church, should, and we've had guys get up and share with the church, Guys, I just need to let you know, I struggle with this. I mean, if you, and again, I would say if anyone's judging you, remember you also sinners, but then be wise. Don't let him do kids ministry. Yeah, because he struggles in this area. Don't let him babysit your kids. And so the church needs to know for his protection and for ours, not that we ever look down our nose at him, but that we can make sure as a brother that we love him and cocoon him and protect him as best as we can from his own evil desires. Make sense? There's one scenario where it's not private, always. And that's where it's a leader, where it's an elder. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5 verse 20, those elders who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that others may take warning. Because we carry a public office, if one of us as elders sin, it's immediately public. And you'll see that in the Bible, Peter sins and Paul publicly calls him out uh, you know, in Galatians. Uh, and so we know when an elder sins, he is to be rebuked publicly. So when one of our elder sins, you'll see they'll get up and they will confess their sin. And sometimes that might mean it might even be a disqualifying sin for a while. They might have to step out of leadership to fix or to heal that part of them that's broken. Does that make sense? Heart is always to heal. It's not to punish. But remember, an elder has to be temperate and whole. And if this is revealing something that he hasn't got victory in, that will spill over into the church. And so he needs to be taken out of that position kind of like a person that's damaged in a sports field or maybe rugby or soccer, pulled aside, healed so that he can be put back ideally to actually play. Does that make sense? But let's say the person doesn't repent. So that's leaders. If the person doesn't repent, we got to take another brother along and now it starts to become public. It ends off with Jesus saying, treat him as you would a tax collector or a Gentile. Now, this is a Jew speaking to Jews. This is it Jesus? Uh, I know we like to think Jesus hung out with tax collectors, but, but the, the Jewish mindset Jesus is talking into is 
to a Jew, a tax collector who worked for Rome was a traitor to his country and a Gentile was unclean. So even when I went to Israel a few years ago, I had this moment at the Wailing Wall. Many of you have seen the Wailing Wall and there's kind of Jews, devout Jews crying out because they can't get to the Holy of Holiness anymore because the Muslims have taken the Temple Mount. So they've actually, anyway, so they, they stand there crying. And I remember being at the Wailing Wall and watching their devotion. And then I went to the toilets and I was washing my hands in the toilet and a Jewish man, proper Jewish man, side he's the whole, I mean, he's a proper Jew, walks in and he, he, he starts to wash his hands and he looks across and he sees me and he realizes I'm a Gentile. And he actually did this. <gasps> and I'm standing there and I'm like, <laughs> he, he literally, <gasps> like, like I had leprosy. And I remember he looks at me and he was, he was about to touch the tap and I realized there was a jug there. And I see, now he's not going to touch the tap because a Gentile might have touched that tap. If I touch the tap, I make it unclean. If he touches the tap, he has to go through this elaborate system of trying to get his sins forgiven because I've, I've corrupted him by my sinfulness. And so he literally washes his hands with the jug because he's scared that he might touch something that I've touched. When Jesus says, treat him as you would a tax collector or a Gentile, he's talking about hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Sin is deadly. Don't mess it. And we see this played out beautifully in, um, and, and in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 4 to 5, Paul actually, again, we want every matter to be stepped by two more witnesses. So as we dig into this in the Bible. Paul says this, when you are assembled, now this is a church discipline case. He's actually giving us textbook. He's doing it. So this guy that he's talking about is having sex with his father's new wife. So a son, his father's probably remarried and the boy is having sex with his new mom. And the church is not doing anything about it. So Paul writes and he says, you've got to fix this. And this is how you do it. It's obviously unrepentant. When you are assembled, so now the church is gathered in the name of our Lord Jesus. And I'm with you in spirit because Paul can't be with them, but he's with them in spirit. And the power of our Lord Jesus is present. Hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. What is he saying? He says, this is now public. Obviously, we've mentioned Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5. It's now become a public thing. This guy's unrepentant. Hand this man over to Satan. Effectively, what you're doing is you're saying, we are now taking him out of the protection of the church where God says, I command my angels concerning you. And we're taking that with the government of heaven off of him. And we're literally saying, because of your sin and your unrepentedness, God is going to discipline you. But how he's going to do it is he's going to lift protection from you. And so we, the church, will literally, in this sense, hand this man over to Satan. We're saying he's not listening to God. Go for it. And the angels and all the things that protect him step back. And he's on his own before the devil. Now, the devil wants to kill, destroy. And so what happens is hell breaks out against that man. The point of this note is not to destroy the man. It's to save the man. You want his sinful nature destroyed, but the spirit saved in the day of the Lord. So the hope is this, that it'll become so horrible in the devil's territory that he'll remember the good things that he had in God's house. And like the, the boy with the pig style eating the pig slop, go, even the slaves in my father's house live better than I'm living. And so he will turn back to God and find the father waiting with open arms and the church waiting with open arms to draw him back. But he has to turn away from that sinful nature that must be destroyed so that he can come back to father's house and his spirit saved in the day of the Lord. In other words, if he doesn't repent, turn back to the Lord, he's in danger now of not being saved on the day of the Lord, which is exactly what we read in Hebrews just now, that he could turn away from the living God. Does you see that? So it is redemptive and we must realize it's always redemptive and I'm taking too long. <laughs> so... And then quickly, just to break it down, how does that um, work in terms of, you know, I want us to dig into this a little bit more to see how we respond upon the unrepentant sinner. And in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9 to 13, Paul gives us this long list of stuff, sins, and I want to just break them down quickly. I've written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Sexual immorality um, is something that needs to be repented of. If it's in the church, it's going to destroy the church. So we don't associate with, we, we got Matthew, that principle comes in Matthew 18, go one, twice, come on, turn from yourself. If you won't, you have to discipline him. Then he says, not, I'm not talking about the people of the world. Who, they're obviously immoral and the greed in the swords and idolaters. 
Because then you'd have to leave the world. Remember, they're not in the house of God. They are going to do those things. So we don't judge the world. But when it comes to God's house, we care for our brothers. And so now I'm writing that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, they're gossiping, a drunkard or even a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. So we start to see sins and then we start to see the response of the church. Hand him over to Satan. We'll look at a few others quickly. Um, in Romans 16, 17, listen to this one. I urge, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you've learned. Keep away from them. So now we learn when people are teaching false doctrines or they're, putting, they're being divisive, they're turning brothers against brothers. Have you heard about that guy, what he did? And they start to slander and gossip and cause division. We actually must keep away from those people. We need to discipline them. Titus 3 verse 10, warn a divisive person once, then warn him a second time after they have nothing to do with them. So these are all, you see this over and over again coming through. Um, and I'm losing you guys, so let me land this. <laughs> all right. Interesting, I'll give you one more and then we'll, we'll move this to land. In 2 John 10 and 11, John says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring solid teaching or bad teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. Bad teaching destroys. So you start to realize, did you think of sin as this dangerous? I mean, it's a question I'd love to ask. Because I think we're just kind of so used to, but sin kills. The Corinthian church people are dying in that church because sin is not being dealt with. This is a very serious thing and something that the church needs to take heed of and, and, and learn from. And so again, the heart is always repentant to, to bring repentance. So you hand them over to Satan so that their spirit will be, their sinful nature destroyed and their spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Um, and then what happens is, what happens when the person comes to their senses? They come back and they say, okay, I've messed up. And I remember years ago, and we, I've, I've, I mean, I've disciplined my own sister at one point out of the church. She was sexually immoral, married woman, had an affair and another affair. And I remember actually putting her out of the church She's repentant. God's done an amazing work. She's that, her and her husband are actually leading one of our congregations today. But I remember one specific scenario that I'd love to tell you. And it was a, a young lady who she said I could share her story. And uh, she came into the church and got saved in our church. And she was very, very broken. She'd kind of been abused and uh, just really had a, a struggle to understand her sense of worth and value. So what she learned to do in the world before she was saved is she... She basically had sex with any guy that would give her attention. And, and sometimes it would be possibly even three guys a day. Any guy that gave her attention, she would sleep with because she felt that this was her way of, of just building up her broken self-image. So then she got saved and she was so broken in sin because sin destroys us. It breaks us out of the image of God that she struggled with this thing. And I remember so often coming to me and saying, Andrew, I've fallen again. I was like, it, it, I mean, it was, it, it was like once a day at one point. But she kept coming and saying, I've fallen again. I've, I, can God forgive me? I, I don't want to do it. And we walked her through forgiveness and finding grace in your time of need and covered her sin, never made it public. And then she began to find help. And over time, she began to fall once every three days and then once a week. And it was like, yay, once a week. Woo because for her, this was huge. For some of us, it'd be like, what? But for her, this was God was slowly fixing her and healing her. And then... I'll never forget the one. She actually did quite well. She was starting to go like possibly even a month. And then one Sunday she brought a friend to church, a guy. Um, he actually got saved. I led him to the Lord that night. And uh, she took him home and slept with him. Yeah. It's just like, <laughs> and being the church that we are, we found out quite soon. And I called her and I said, what's happening? And she said, this is not sin. Remember, sin's deceitful. Yeah. This is not sin because we love each other and we're going to get married. So because we're going to get married, God blesses this. And I'm like, no, nah, the Bible says that's not how it works. The Bible's clear. You're deceiving yourself. And she said, I'm not deceived. You, you know, don't put this on me. And, uh, you know, I'm free and Jesus loves me. And I was like, you, you're sinning. You, you've got to turn off me. sin, please. And uh, she wouldn't. And I remember just pleading with her and eventually just saying, oh, man, you know, on Sunday night, if you don't repent, I've, I have to put you out the church. We're going to have to do this. So on Sunday night, I'm going to wait for you at the church outside. I'm going to stand at the door. 
if you come to your senses before then, please come and I'll be waiting. And I remember standing that Sunday at the door waiting, hoping and praying that she would come and she just never did. And eventually the meeting was like 15 minutes later and I had to walk up in front of the church and, and bring it to the church. So this is Malcolm, you were actually there, I think. This is what's happened. And I remember she was a sister, man. We'd fought so hard for her. And I remember this like, like we've lost a daughter. We've lost someone that we fought for for over a year now. And she's gone. And it was like, ah. And uh, I mean, I remember we were, we were weeping because we'd all fought and prayed so much for her. And um, she was gone. And we treated her like a pagan or tax collector. She was gone. Till she repents. A year later, didn't hear from her, see for a year. And a year later, I remember I was actually, I still remember because I hate doing dishes. And I was doing dishes. <laughs> And we had a double story house that we'd built. And I remember looking down at our driveway and, and I saw her car pull into my driveway. And I ran downstairs and she climbed out of a car and she looked like she'd aged, like she looked like she'd aged like 50 years. Her hair had fallen out. Um, she just looked a mess. And she came and she said, please lift this discipline off of me. From the day you disciplined me, my life has fallen apart. Everything has gone wrong. I just can't stay where I am anymore. Remember, your sinful nature destroyed. Your spirit saved in the day of the Lord. And she was like, take this from me. And I said, are you repentant? Do you realize what you've done is wrong? That God loves you and he wants to bring you back. And she said, yes, I know I've sinned. I know I've done wrong. And I've broken up with this guy. It's not worked out. And I, can, I, can Jesus take me back? And I'm like, of course. The, 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 the throne of grace is open. And she said, I'll come lift the discipline, but I'm too embarrassed to come back to church. And I said, you don't understand the church because we all sin. And we, no one can judge you for what you've done. If you repent, it's as though you've never sinned. And anyway, she came and I said, please, please come. And she came that Sunday night. And I'll never forget getting up in front of the church. It was so small, maybe a hundred people at that time. And I remember she was there and I remember saying, guys, this is what's happened. And the church just got up and ran and embraced her as, as a sister that had come home. And she was standing there crying. We were crying because the lost sheep had come home. She had turned back to the Lord and had turned her life around. And funny enough, Somehow in that process, her sinful nature had broken and she broke free from sexual addiction. And she was actually set free in that place. And she's actually, I saw her the other day. She's actually in, I think, our Esme congregation right now. And she, that was a life-changing moment for her. And you go, this is discipline to restore the sinner. And Paul writes about the same thing in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 2 verse 5 to 8. Because what happens is the guy they've disciplined, that young man that I mentioned in 1 Corinthians, repents. And so Paul writes and he says, if anyone has caused grief, and that's what we felt, we'd all felt the grief. He has not so much grieved me as he's grieved all of you because it hurts when someone we love has to be cut off. Not to put it too severely. And then he says the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. In other words, he's been through the process of discipline. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. And so you've got this person comes back and now your, your sin is forgiven. No one can look down at you for what you've done because if God forgets and removes our sin as far as the east from the west, so does the church. And so we embrace that person, reaffirm our love and bring them back into the fellowship because now they're the lost sheep. It's come home, the prodigal son that's returned to the father and the church embraces them. And so this is one of the tools that God gives the church. And it's so important that the church does it God's way because we, we did a study a number of years ago and uh, there was a time when this was so hard to do and no one does it. So we looked like a cult because we did it. And I remember at one point people realizing, and I mean, it's so clear, but you know, no one does this. And so I remember people would realize, okay, they're sinning and they would go, yeah, I'm just leaving Josh Jen. I'm just going to go to another church. And I remember going, okay, fine. And we just kind of, okay, it's gone. And I'll never forget one day I was in worship and I was worshiping the Lord and the Lord spoke to me. And I didn't know I was doing anything wrong. I just thought, I escaped that one because I don't want to look like a bad guy. And I'm worshiping the Lord and the Lord said to me, you're not like me, son. And I went, what, what do you mean, Lord? And he said, I discipline those that I love. Oh, and I realized I was a coward. I realized it was too hard to do that. And I realized... I was scared of what people think as a leader if I did what God asked me to do. And so I had not shepherded the sheep, sheep properly. I hadn't done what God had asked me to do. And I remember in that moment repenting and saying, Lord, forgive me. And I had to 
you know, bring it to the elders and say, guys, I, I, we've sinned, you know, we've, 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 we've kind of taken the easy route. And we did a little survey. Mark Davies did this. And, and I might have my facts slightly wrong, but it's something down this line. Those that left the church quietly on their own, none of them have repented and been restored. But of those that we've disciplined, it's as much as 80% have returned to the Lord and are back in fellowship. And so God's ways might seem difficult for us, but God is wise in how he builds. And so as the community, you will see this played out because sin is inevitable. There is sin around us. And we're a large church. And so when this happens, this teaching is to, firstly, if you're the one it's happening to, turn back to God. Because God doesn't want to lose you. He loves you. But he loves you, so he will discipline you because he wants you with him forever in heaven. And when you see this happening, this gives you a theological understanding of, oh, this is that thing that we learned about so that you can understand the ways of the Lord and actually work this out in such a way that the community can see that person restored. My sister said this when we disciplined her out the church. She was out for a year. Didn't see her for a year. My sister, my little sister, and I love her dearly. She said this when she came back. Andrew, if you as a family didn't cut me off, I would have carried on in sin. But I remembered what we had as a family. I remembered the love. I remembered what I had amongst the believers. And because they cut me off, I started longing for that so much that I longed for that more than I longed for my sin. And she repented and turned back to the Lord. And today, she and her husband are serving, they're leading one of our congregations. God disciplines whom he loves. And so must we as his people. And so I share this with you and those that are watching so that we can make sure that we build our churches based on God's ways, the Bible way. Even if we look weird, it's so clear. How do we not do it God's way? Amen? Amen. 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 Andrew, can I ask a question? Yeah. I think for, for many of us, you know, the idea of being addicted to sex and having sex to each other, <coughs> and some of these more extreme situations, we think, oh, that's, that's not me. They're so far removed. But for many of us, we have these little areas of compromise and, and, and sin in our lives. We go, it's not hurting anyone. Everyone does it. But sin incrementally increases. And, and those, no one starts off. They start off with just like, okay, we don't like it. And you could do it. 100%. That. You must realize sin is deadly. Sin gives birth to sin, gives birth to death. So don't, you got to be radical with sin. When you, when you become aware of something in your life, it's not what the Lord wants. You need to bring that to God and, and even sometimes confess your sins one to another, the Bible says, because there is a sense of a break to you that can come and people can walk with you and hold you to account. Sin kills, make no mistake. Sin kills and little sins very quickly have a deceptive nature. So every time you do that, something's happening in your heart and you'll start to find you start, you're not hearing God's voice anymore. You're not, you, you, you've lost, your faith is starting to die. You, you've lost your excitement for the things of God. Those are all signs of sins working its way evilly into your heart causing deception and, and, and um, hardness of heart. And so deal with sin radically. And, um, and, and I mean, any sin, I mean, I mean, sin kills and we need to bring it before the Lord. Now, and when I say that, and I know that if I sin, I'm not cut off from God immediately. I mean, I can, but if I carry on sinning, something starts to happen to me inside. And at some point I can turn away from him because sin has now hardened me to that extent. So don't play with it because it is deadly. And it will destroy you. And not only that, but it'll, it'll affect us. Because Akinson stopped the whole, the, whole, the whole nation walking in the favor and the blessing of God. We are accountable one to another as members of Christ's body. And we must realize that we are more connected than we realize. So deal with sin. Deal with sin. Porn. It's, that's sexual immorality. Deal with it. Uh, deal with gossip and slander. Deal with a loose tongue. Deal with Those are all things that destroy the house of God. Deal with bitterness and anger. Deal with those things. Idolatry even, he says. You're loving something more than you love the Lord. Deal with those things because if you don't, they will. They have the potential to destroy your faith and ultimately in that destroy you as well. So deal with it very, very strongly. One of the conversations we've been having at the moment is something that the, the, the world is bringing to the church is actually the idolizing by the confidentiality and, and that that creates a safe space. I'll conceal it. And so I'll come to a friend and go, I did this. And it's not really confessing. It's actually just me getting it off my chest. But you yeah. want to keep it quiet. 
And so confidential issue comes in, but it, it's actually cultivating like a greenhouse effect for sin and a compromise. I'll tell you a true story on that because we do like to cover us and we, we're shamed. But remember, there's no shame in the house of God. We confess our sins freely one to another. A few years ago, I was involved. Uh, I was, there was a, a pastor in the city. He wasn't connected to us, but he led a whole network of churches. And he called me one day and said, could I speak to you? So I had a meal with him and I didn't know what it was about. And somewhere in the meal, he said, man, I know you guys do church discipline. We don't know how it works in our movement. So how does it work? Because I've got this friend and uh, he's sleeping with a woman in this one church and um, I don't know how to deal with it. And as he said it to me, the Holy Spirit said to me, it's him. He's talking about himself. And so I said to this man, he's talking about yourself. And he, he kind of looked at me and he said this. And it was so fast, I didn't catch what he said. Don't tell anyone. And then he started confessing and he just it blurted out. And so, and so he told me the story. There was a, he would go up the coast. There was a, a woman, um, he led this ministry that was national ministry. And he would go up the coast and stay with friends of theirs who, who were also in ministry. And when the husband would go out, he would sleep with the guy's wife and uh, had kept it quiet. She had actually started trying to confess that what was happening to her husband and this guy had denied it. And so her and her husband and the church felt that she was trying to undermine this man's ministry. He was actually saying they're trying to undermine my ministry. So her husband and the church began to turn on her when she was trying to confess her sin. So I'm like, so he finishes this and I'm like, Rue, you need to go and sort that out. Uh, I know you said don't tell anyone, but there's no confidentiality. You need to go and sort that out. Because if you don't go and sort it out, I'm going to go and sort it out. Because you've got a woman who they were at that time trying to get into a mental home because they were saying she was lying and she was a deceiver. And so he said, okay, sort it out. So he's not in our movement, not, not connected to us. So I, I phoned him a while later, how's it gone? No, 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 I've pulled my leadership and they all know and it's all sorted out, so it's all great. So I'm like, but then I find out later, this couple are actually in a, a friend of mine's church and this guy phones me and he's not telling me the situation from his side and he's, he's saying this woman's lying, this, this guy's in ministry. And so I hear now on this side that this woman is now, and they're about to discipline this woman for confessing her, what she's done. And I'm like, I, I, this was supposed to be dealt with. I'm sorry, I didn't know that she was in your church. And I began to explain to him. And uh, this, this guy just began to deny everything. And, uh, and so he's trying to cover his sin, sin and deceitfulness. And I remember it was about a few weeks after that, I was driving back from a weekend. It was Sunday night. We had church on Sunday night. And I was driving back to church uh, after a weekend away. And um, I, I remember driving just past Somerset West. And I got a phone call. And a friend of mine was phoning me and said, pray, no one knew about this situation except the pastor. And because anyway, I get this phone call, this man who's fallen, who's lying in ministry has hurt himself in an accident. They've managed to resuscitate him, pray for him, that God will give him back because he's fighting for his life. So I put down the phone and I began to pray. And as I began to pray, I felt the Lord say this to me, don't pray for him. I'm taking him. And I said, babes, I feel like, I started to pray instinct and I was like, I feel like God says, I, can't, I mustn't pray for him. God's going to take him. And he would actually been resuscitated at that time. So it seemed like, and, uh, and then what happened was I got a phone call about probably 20 minutes later, he's died. I believe God took that man. God judged that man because he was doing damage to the house of God. The Bible says, if you destroy the temple, God will destroy you. God took that man um, because he didn't deal with his sin. He covered it. And I, so again, I would say, deal with your sin because we, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You can come to him and find grace in your time of need, but if you fall into his hands in sin, you don't want to be there. Uh, he, he's, he's, he's merciful and just and, and loves to forgive. But if you trample the Son of God under your feet and you carry on in sin, woe to you. Uh, and so we need to deal with these things carefully. And it's a, it's, a, it's a life lesson for us that we need to make sure we do well. Amen.